All right, I wasn't even thinking about this really whenever I started putting the message together, but it kind of actually ends up going right along with that theme of the boundaries. And uh, we will have Brother uh, Dean preach here pretty soon, but he wants to sit down and, and talk about some things with me and get some some tips and all that. So I told him, take take your time. You know, he's he's watched some of you guys preach, and you've preached several times. You've been up here. You got to a point where you preach an entire message by yourself, and that's probably overwhelming. And so I'm trying to remind him, hey, man, just get up there. You know, some people at the beginning, I remember reading just a few verses and then just saying what that verse, you know, was talking about and expounding on that a little bit. And so, uh, look, just I enjoy the opportunity to hear you guys and to see see the growth. But you know what? I, I was thinking about this earlier. I was like, man, some of these guys, I feel like they've grown a lot in the last few years. But you know what? I feel like I've grown a ton in the last few years. And that's just iron sharpening iron. It's hanging out with uh, other people and going out. Uh, you grow a lot when you go soul winning. It's just so continuing to go soul winning and everything. Uh, uh, and just thinking about the, the amount of preparation for sermons, all that has helped me to grow. So we're all growing together, and uh, that's what the church is about. And in the Lord's Supper that we're taking, as I was sitting down studying that out and thinking about uh, all that, preached on it here recently, but a big part of that, I believe, is the church coming together in just unity. You know, Paul was talking about, and there in 1 Corinthians 11, saying, you know, hey, there's divisions among you, and I have no doubt there's heresies among you and everything. And he's saying, when you come together, it's for the worse and not for the better. And, and really, if we think about it, when we come together, it should always be for the better. We should always be lifting each other up, uh, building one another up, and, uh, and learning and growing. And so uh, I, I love that. I love the church. I love, we kind of my original thought was, you know, we're all the same church there in Iola, here in Kansas City, I got it right that time. <laughs> the locations, you know, here's what the thing, I, or, I already have a little bit of kind of like an ADD mind or something, if you've never noticed that. But see, today I just started 30 days of training for Spanish, and I'm trying to present the gospel in Spanish and be able to do that and speak fluently. So I've got a bunch of Spanish going on in my mind. I'm thinking this might be a really bad idea because I already have a hard time staying focused, and now I've got another language to compete with <laughs> in my mind. It could either help or, or it could hurt, okay? But anyway, uh, but anyway, it seems like sometimes there's like two churches going on, one, a church in Iola and a church in Kansas City. You think about what church means, an assembly or a congregation, and there kind of is, you know, same pastor, same, uh, we all, you know, uh, are practically the same uh, by, uh, uh, by government, if you will, the church government, but we're kind of two different churches, and I love different aspects of each church of those uh, locations. And, uh, and anyway, as I'm thinking about churches, I really want you to know my heart. And my heart is that, you know what, what we need to do as a church is worry about our church. And I'm in Iola. What we need to do is worry about that church, okay? And not be so concerned about this church does that, and oh, we're better than that church, and they don't do it this way, and all that. When you start thinking that way, it's, it causes a lot of problems. And so we got to be super careful not to do that. It gets hard sometimes because you, uh, we think of our uh, uh, kind of selfishly. All of us humans think selfishly, and so we just think like our team's better or our team does it this way. And all of a sudden, everybody else becomes the enemy, and we don't ever want to be like that. So when I preach certain things like this, I walk a thin line, you know, of criticizing other people's ministries and all that. But look, there's some things that, for the sake of Hey, I have a responsibility to this church, and for the sake of saying, look, we we want to understand that, you know, I want you to understand why I think some of these things are so bad. I'll tell you where this the idea of this uh, sermon came from, and the title of the message is "How Pagan Can We Get?" How pagan can we get? On when I announced on online what the the what I was preaching throughout this week, I left today's blank because I wasn't sure exactly what was going to happen. So today I put on there I'm preaching. To, uh, or yesterday, I put, I'm preaching tomorrow night in Kansas City on how pagan can we get? Some people are like, is that a challenge? I mean, because <laughs> I'm sure we could get pretty pagan. Some people said, are you going to be rebuking them or what's going on? And I said, well, a little bit of both, okay? Because I'm rebuking the mentality that seems to be like, hey, how pagan can we get <laughs> and still be Christians? You know, how much like the world can we be and, uh, and still, be, still be Christians? And, and uh, when I thought about this, uh, the, this concept, it wasn't from reading 2 Corinthians 6, although that's where we're going to be, but it was, it was I'll tell you primarily what it was, is Easter's coming up, and every time Easter comes up, 
all the churches start breaking out the Easter egg hunts and, uh, and all these things that they're doing. Now, here's the thin line. You know, if another church has a bus ministry and they bring a bunch of kids in and they do an Easter egg hunt, look, Iola Baptist Temple did that historically for many, many years. They'd have an Easter egg hunt. Lots of kids would come. And if kids are coming and they're getting saved, I don't feel like it's my job to knock them down or just say like, oh, how wicked they are because they have Easter egg hunts. But I'll tell you, it does make me kind of sick to my stomach. And uh, hopefully the message will kind of explain why that is. But we saw uh, online, my wife was actually showing me uh, what one of the churches are doing for a fundraiser for their kids to be able to go to camp. They'll go to your house, if, I under if we understand this right, they'll go to your house and while the kids are sleeping, they'll hide the Easter eggs in their yard. And, uh, and, and so that raises money for them to be able to go to camp. And so that the kids wake up in the morning and say, whoa, where do those eggs come from? The Easter bunny, I guess. And I'm thinking, this is just my, my personal feeling is, you know, what you teach your kids at home. You know, I grew up believing Easter Bunny, Santa Claus to some degree when I was really, really little. Uh, but we never taught our kids about those things. And my thinking was, particularly when you're, when you're having a holiday that's supposed to glorify the Lord, whether it's Christmas or it's Easter and you substitute that with Santa Claus, Easter Bunny, things like that, not only are you lying to your kids, telling these things exist that don't exist, but you're de-emphasizing what they're supposed to be celebrating, and you're giving that honor and that glory to something other than Christ. And I feel like that's wrong. And for a church to do it, I feel like it's, 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 it's especially wrong, okay? I don't give people too much of a hard time if I find out they're doing that, especially in the world, right? I go to the store and they got Easter bunnies and eggs and all that kind of stuff. I expect that. We're in the world. <laughs> That's what they do. They under, you know, they don't know any different. And uh, even Christians who grew up that way uh, haven't been in a church that, you know, emphasize why that's wrong or something. I understand. I give grace. I give a little bit of liberty. I understand people are different. But I do feel like as a pastor, I have a responsibility to this church. And so I want you to know where my heart is, not just for the sake of just tearing down other people and what they do, but for saying, look, if you really think about it, that's a pretty wicked thing to do, to just worship God and say, you know what, we're just going to embrace all these pagan practices and all that. Now, how far am I going to go in this message and breaking down the pagan roots of Easter, you know, should the word Easter be in the book of Acts? Is that really a, a word that should be in there? Did the King James translators get that right? And and I listened to a whole message. I, lo I love uh, Brother James Knox. I don't know if you ever listened to, to him. We obviously wouldn't agree on everything, but I hate that you even have to preface that because really that's about 99.9% .9 of people aren't going to agree on everything. But uh, but I listened to him, and, and he's one of those guys that, that really despises the pagan origin of Christmas and Easter. He's against Christmas trees and all that. I'm not. But he does have, uh, we'll save that till Christmas. I'll preach on that. <laughs> but he does have liberty in the, in the sense that he knows there are people out there that didn't grow up that way. They don't, you know, he has patience with them and everything. I remember hearing the one message that he preached on where some of the people in his church had come around to his way of thinking on the pagan roots of Easter and Christmas and all that. And all of a sudden, like the people that celebrated that were wicked. And he had to like scold the people in his church because he's like, he's like, the people that you are, you know, cursing at and, and, and talking about how wicked they are, like you, you believed that like two weeks ago. <laughs> you didn't think it was that wicked whenever you were doing it, you know. So I have a little bit of patience, a little bit of grace with those people uh, who you're tearing down. And I try to do that. I really do. Okay, uh, I, I used to, I'm a, I, I still sometimes will uh, be a little controversial on Facebook. Every good pastor ought to be from time to time, okay? <laughs> and, uh, just teasing. But I do sometimes get a little controversial on Facebook. But I'm going to tell you this, I, I, I've changed a lot from the way, way I used to be because I would just put some blanket statement on there, you know, about how wicked this is, for instance, you know, that they would have, a church would have Easter egg hunts. And, with no background, and you got all these different people reading that with different, you know, upbringings and different places in their spiritual walk. And so I decided not to necessarily handle it that way. But I'll tell you this, when you get behind the pulpit and you got to lay certain things down, you're going to say certain things like, hey, that is a wicked practice to do. We won't ever do that here. A church 
uh, where they do do that or someone that would be listening to this online or whatever and they are from a church that does that would be like, oh, how dare he, he, he say that? But look, I just, I, I'm going to be as true as I can to the Bible. But I want to tell you in this sermon uh, what I think the Bible says about how we are not supposed to be pagan. And let me explain the word pagan because actually the word pagan itself is not in the Bible, but some similar synonymous words would be heathen or infidel, okay? That's, those aren't in the Bible a whole lot either, but we know what they mean, heathen or infidel. Uh, sometimes it's talking about strangers. Uh, you think about the word that the Jews used to this day for, for non-Jews. Anybody know what that word is? Goyim. Uh, I just want to see if someone else, I want to have someone else pronounce it so they knew. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, Goyim. That's the word where they get, uh, one of the words where they would translate into like infidel or unbeliever or whatever. Now, obviously, today, the Jews are the, the infidels, <laughs> you know, because they don't believe in Christ. Okay, but at that time, they had the true religion following, following their true God. And anybody else who didn't believe in those practices, they followed false gods or whatever, they would call them uh, what we would call today in English heathen or infidel or pagan would be a more modern term, came after, way after the, hundreds of years after the King James. Look at our text again, 2 Corinthians 6, and look at verse 15. <clears throat> and what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And so... I'm going to try to break down some of the verses in this chapter here and this mind, the, 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 the principle behind here. You know, how can that person who believes in Jesus Christ and wants to follow Jesus Christ, what part does he have with someone who doesn't believe all that and just lives just however they want to live or whatever? Now, obviously, uh, there are, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. Obviously, there are times that we have got to be in this world. We want to preach the gospel to this world. So obviously, we're preaching the gospel to non-believers, uh, pagans, people who believe in the God of Odin. And uh, uh, did you say it was Viking? Is that a Viking? You sound like you understood, you've heard about this, uh, this religion before, something like that. We thought he'd just been watching too much uh, Avengers or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where he, where this came from, but uh, I overheard him saying, well, no, no disrespect to your religion, but I believe in the God of Odin or something like that. And I was like, what? <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard that before. <laughs> but at some point, we know there's going to be people out there believing some strange things. We met a Muslim lady. Uh, you remember that picture we had with, with Nick and he had uh, the white socks on him? <laughs> and he's uh, uh, got this lady from... I don't know where that one was, maybe Congo or something like that. And she had, uh, they had like the drapes, you know, like uh, material hanging from the ceiling and I mean, from the walls and all that stuff. And they had the Muslim garb and all that kind of stuff. And anyone in there was able to witness to her and show her uh, a presentation of the gospel in, uh, on the cell phone, actually. Uh, so it was kind of funny because you live that, you, you walk in there and you're like, man, we're like in a third world country, but then they got the TV going and they got the cell phone in their hand and you're like, this is pretty weird <laughs> dichotomy here. And so, uh, but anyway, I was able to get her, uh, uh, talk with her a little bit, share the differences in our faith. She actually said that she listens to some Christian teachers on television, which could be dangerous, but at least she's open to, uh, to listening to the Christian view. So talked about that a little bit, was only able to leave, with, leave her, and I'm glad I did because our, our conversation kind of got cut off, but she has, and she had actually started playing our YouTube video, the presentation of the gospel, because uh, she spoke really good English, so we didn't have to worry about uh, Swahili or anything. And she started playing it, so it's in her history, so she can go back and watch it any time and listen to that. Uh, but why did I say all that? Because we're going to come in contact with people who believe in different gods, obviously. And we don't just be like, hey, I don't have any part with you. You're a son of Belial, whatever. You know, we want to preach the gospel to them. We want to understand that. But that's not the same as a Christian just kind of embracing and acting like and adopt, adapting the customs of these other religions or even the secular humanistic religion of our, of our nation today and adopting that and saying, hey, well, let's put that into the church and let's be just like the world. And uh, there's a big problem with that way of thinking. And so that verse right there is kind of where we get this idea in verse 15, look at Matthew 6, 6, if you would hold your place in 2 Corinthians. 
Matthew 6, 6. Jesus talks about the heathen. He says, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father, uh, which is in secret, and thy father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. Verse 7, But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions, as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. So he's saying, look, there's a group of people out there that make these long prayers and they do all these repetitious prayers, maybe chants or whatever. And he's like, look, don't, don't try to pray like those people. Don't try to be like those people, right? You're going to pray differently. And you're going to. And so as Christians, we want to see what did Jesus say? What does the Bible say? What, what did the prophets teach us? What did the disciples teach uh, that Jesus' words were? God gave us this Bible so we could know what to do. We don't have to go to the world you know, for our philosophy on how to reach the world. And this is what a lot of churches, uh, where, they, where they go wrong. <laughs> um, when I think of the vain repetition, call no man father, I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on. You know which religion I always think about. You know, I think about Catholicism. And when you knock on a door, before you ever knock on the door, you know if a Catholic lives there because there's idols everywhere and there's the imagery and there's all this kind of stuff and the prayer beads and, you know, uh, uh, you understand immediately, okay, these people follow traditions of men and they don't follow the Bible. And uh, we're getting ready to take the Lord's Supper here this week. And, and you know what? The Lord's Supper, I, I just spent so much time Sunday thinking about this and studying on this before, that, the week before. And in Sunday school, we broke down kind of the Catholic teachings and how that's, that's been as kind of like infil, uh, uh, as, as, uh, infiltrated the common practice of the Lord's Supper, even in the Baptist churches. And I grew up my whole life with certain ideas and concepts. I didn't know where they came from. But when we took the Lord's Supper, I didn't know how I was supposed to feel or how I was supposed to act or whatever. But a lot of that was passed down from the Catholic Church. And, and you know that they are, the, are literally doing what, what I, I believe what 1 Corinthians 11 says when he says not to take it unworthily. I think they're literally taking it unworthily because they think what they're taking is giving them salvation. They take it's, think it's literally becoming the body of Christ. And the idea is if they understood salvation... They would understand that baptism is a picture of salvation. The Lord's Supper is a picture of what Jesus did and taking, receiving that and believing that. And so, uh, and so they got it all wrong. And the, and the religions of the world, here's what's funny. Mainstream Christianity, mainstream uh, evangel, 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 evangelical Christianity, you know what they do? Well, the Catholics have such a beautiful religion, and I just love the, uh, you know, the, the 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 decorations, and I love all the practices. And they look at the Greek or the Greek Orthodox and all that kind of stuff. Y'all know that? Uh, Y'all ever remember hearing the name Sean? Uh, oh, let's see, what's his name? Hank Hanegraaff. Okay, Hank Hanegraaff. I mean, I wouldn't recommend listening to even his old stuff, but he's called the Bible Answer Man, and he'd have this show on the radio where he would an, an, uh, people would call in with all these various Christian uh, uh, doctrinal questions and stuff. And he seemed like a pretty straightforward uh, guy. I mean, he had some weird views. Certainly wasn't King James only or any of that. So, so uh, that should have been my first clue. <laughs> but uh, but he had uh, he had some interesting views. And all of a sudden, one day he comes out and he's Greek Orthodox. And everybody was just shocked, like, Hank Hanegraaff is Greek Orthodox? It seems like he'd be, like, exposing Greek Orthodox and calling them out and everything. But when you listen to him, to, to him tell the story, he's like, he began studying that because it was so beautiful, and he just loved their dedication and how sincere they were and all that kind of stuff. And so eventually, I guess that that attracted him to it, and he began going down that path. And, and look, this is what people do because they want a certain look or a certain style or whatever that's pagan. That's pagan. It's not the God of the Bible, Amen. but they say it's so beautiful. I want that, and so they incorporate the God of Onan or the Viking God or the uh, you know the the mythical gods on TV or the Star Star Wars gods. You know the 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 dark side and the you know the Force and and all that kind of stuff. And people really start believing it because it's cool, and they think it, they, that's what they want to believe in. Okay, but we want to be very careful not to do that. What does the Bible say about imitating? pagans or heathens or infidels, okay? 
And let me just show you, particularly, uh, we'll go to a couple other places, but particularly I'm getting these main points from 2 Corinthians 6. This is kind of like the go-to chapter, I think, because it says, you know, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, verse 14. What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? And what part hath the believer with the infidel? This is a good place to go. Okay, and so it just so happens, I think, that in this, uh, in this chapter, we can break it down and give you three points about what the Bible says about intimi- uh, uh, I mean, sorry, imitating the pagans. Okay, number one, really simple. This is a simple reason that we should uh, uh, not imitate pagans, right? God calls us to be distinctly different from the world. Amen. He calls us to be distinctly different from the world. Biblical words separate. Okay, we're supposed to be separate. We're supposed to be called out from among them, okay, and, and to be separate. We're supposed to be holy. That's what that word holy means. Separate, you know, something something different, you know, uh, set apart, special. <laughs> you know, like, like uh, you know, there are certain vessels that only come out you know, whenever a good company comes and, and you go to China uh, and you put out the good China or whatever, uh, that, that's something that, you know, this was, those are special, like holy. These are, hey, this is not the stuff that you give the kids that are going to knock over and, and, and break and all that stuff. Well, that's that, what that word means. God's peop- God wants his people to be holy, to be set apart. You know, the Bible talks about how we're equipped, you know, that Jesus left uh, some prophets and teachers and evangelists and all in the church so that he could present his bride spotless, right, and, and, and perfect before God. I'm paraphrasing that section, but yeah, you understand what I mean. We're called to be holy. Look at 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter 1. Verse 14 says, As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. And I remember back into the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says in Luke's account, it says it this way, Be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now you say, well, I don't know what that perfect means. Surely it doesn't mean without sin because none of us were without sin. I agree with you. I don't think that that God would ever expect us to be without sin. He knows us better. But be ye perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. I don't care how you want to define that, how you want to look at that. Our Father in heaven is absolutely perfect. How could we even attempt or try to be like that? But He's called us to, to try to be better, to try to be holier, and to constantly be growing and, uh, uh, and uh, this is why we meet together and we preach from the Bible and we try to hold people to a higher standard. And sometimes there even has to be church discipline on somebody or whatever because we're trying to perfect his body and get holier, get more set apart. All right, not again, there's going to be times where you have to preach the gospel to somebody so it's not set apart like, hey, let's all go and join uh, uh, some uh, monastery or something like that and just, you know, memorize scripture and sit around and do all this and not have any impact on the world. That's not what we're called to do. But in our own lives and in our own family and in our own church, we want to be holy. We want to be set apart. We want to be different. This is a commandment of God. This is what he expects of us. Look at Isaiah chapter 52. This is where I think the verse that he's referring to in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 6, Isaiah chapter 52. And I won't read the whole section here, but if you look at verse 11, Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence, touch no unclean thing, go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean, that bear the vessels of the Lord. Now, if you read the whole context here, Isaiah, Isaiah a lot of times is actually talking prophetically about, I believe, uh, the millennial kingdom. A lot of times when you're reading Isaiah. Now, sometimes, obviously, there were some things that were that were applicable to them in that day. But we know now, reading back, that a lot of those things haven't been fulfilled yet. But they will be fulfilled in the, uh, in the millennial kingdom. And so... Certainly, his people being holy, set apart, perfect, 
you know, not having any sin and not being, uh, you know, contaminated uh, by the things of this world, certainly that will be fulfilled in eternity. Look at Revelation 21. Remember also the, uh, in that time, if you think about the, the Old Testament laws and some of the things God had called the people to, that we no longer are held to those things like the, the uh, dietary laws, for instance. Man, aren't you glad we we can eat we can eat pig and <laughs> catfish and <laughs> so. Uh, uh, but they were called to stay away from those things and not to touch those. Those were unclean, and there are a lot of things that they weren't allowed to do. You know, especially if they were going into the temple or whatever. God put a very high standard on them, and although some of those things were fulfilled in Christ and we're not under those anymore, He still refers back to that verse and as something that we're supposed to look to and say, hey, we're supposed to be separate. We're supposed to be different and we're not supposed to touch the unclean thing, which isn't talking about pigs, but I'm saying it's, uh, it, it is still, it's still a principle that he's, he's called us to. Now that'll be fulfilled one day perfectly in, uh, in eternity. Revelation 21, look at verse 8. We refer to this a lot of times when we're soul winning. But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Look at, uh, let me see here. Uh, let's go down to verse 27. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Okay, there will come a time in eternity, for all eternity, that the only people that, are, that exist there, the way I understand it, are people that are in their perfect glorified body. And hey, the fulfillment of all these things, there's no wickedness. Uh, you know, if, if you go into heaven right now, you'd take your wickedness with you and you'd corrupt heaven, right? But there's going to come a time when none of that stuff is there. And uh, the only way that we could, obviously you're familiar with the gospel, the only way we can get to heaven to begin with is by being having those sins washed away through the blood of, of, of Christ, okay? So we can't get there in our own righteousness because we can never be good enough, but Christ uh, paid that price so that we could go. But one day in our glorified body, we won't have sin. You know, we, we will only have that new man who's uh, been washed and been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Okay, so uh, the New Jerusalem, you know, e into eternity, we understand there's going to be perfection. But even in the millennium, and we won't take the time to look in that, but as you go into the millennium, the way I understand it, hey, we come back ruling and reigning with Christ in our glorified bodies, but there's still going to be corruption on earth. Okay, and some of that is in Isaiah, and it's talking about uh, the millennial kingdom. Most of uh, a lot of Isaiah is talking about the millennial kingdom, and you've got the glorified people in their glorified bodies who are perfected and they're righteous and they're living righteous and we're judging the earth. Okay. And there's still wickedness on the earth. There's still people on the earth who are wicked because after the millennial kingdom, Satan's going to gather them all up and they're going to try one more time to take down God's people. And of course it's not going to work, but he, but, uh, but there will still be this picture of those who are living perfected and they're saying, Hey, I'm not touching the unclean thing. I'm not defiling myself. I'm not having any of that. Those things are all yet to come, right? They don't exist now in the sense that we are all going to defile ourselves. We're all going to sin. We're all going to you know, do some things that we're not supposed to do. But we're still called in the moment right now to be children of the kingdom. We're still right now, Jesus Christ ruling and reigning within us, and we're in Christ. We're supposed to be walking in the new man right now. I know we're not going to because we live in this corrected body. This is why Paul said, hey, I struggle daily between the flesh and the spirit. Uh, and that's going to be the case until we die. But we're supposed to. We're called to. We're, this is why we need to encourage each other. We need to discipline. We need to do all these kinds of things to get us, uh, you know, as perfect as we can be in Jesus Christ right now. Why? Because God calls us to. He called us to do that. Might sound like something that's in, incapable of happening, but something that we're called to do. Let me real quickly give you this as well. Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15 is where the church is starting to realize, um, primarily made up of converted Jews, but, uh, but they're starting to realize that Gentiles are getting saved. 
I mean, they already were getting saved, but it's like it's starting to kind of like now be a thing where they're like, whoa, this is. And so some of these Jews are saying, whoa, but, but they have to be circumcised and they need to do all They're like trying to bring them back under the Old Testament law. Okay, and so here's a, a great passage of Scripture, Acts chapter 15, look at verse 10. They're hashing it out and they're disputing about this uh, and, and talking about, you know, what do we need to require of these new converts, basically. And he says, Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the necks of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Okay, so, so he's saying, hey, it doesn't matter, Jew, Gentile, whatever. You know, there are certain customs that, that we couldn't even keep as Jews is what he's saying. And now these people that aren't Jews and they're under a new covenant and they're born again in Jesus Christ, they don't put those same rules upon them. But then, so, so the question then would be like, okay, so they can just live however they want? Well, no, because they're still called to come out and be separate. And so here's what we'll do. This was the consensus that they agreed on. Here's what we'll do. Look at verse 20. But that we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. Now, you know, to me, I think that means don't eat rare meat, but <laughs> I'm just kidding. <clears throat> These are cultural things that were happening during that time. We probably don't even know exactly what practices were going on. Uh, you could probably some commentaries take a shot at it, but I don't know. We probably don't know exactly what's going on, but clearly... These are cultural things that were going on in this time, and they were saying, you know what, let's at least make sure they don't do these things. Now, it doesn't mean that if they did those that they're going to hell. It just means like, hey, let's give them some standard to shoot for. Hey, you need to come out from among them. Don't live in fornication. Don't do all these practices. Certainly don't have idols and all this kind of stuff. And don't do these customs that they did, the strangling and the things offered to sacrifices and, and whatever. And he's trying to give them a... Uh, you know, something to shoot for. And later he's going to teach them what things to do in the church. Hey, do this, do that. But right now it's like, hey, you know what? Let's just not do these things. And that reminds me of Second Peter where he says, he says, with all diligence, add to your faith virtue. You know, it's almost like, hey, you know what? The first thing you need to do as a Christian, add to your faith virtue. Just start trying to be good, <laughs> trying to stop doing bad. You know, well, what are those things? Well, as you start learning and growing, you say, hey, that, I shouldn't do that. You know, and I'm going to talk about that here a little bit more in a minute. <clears throat> but, uh, but then later on you start adding, well, what things should I do? Well, be patient and temperate and all those things that it says add to your faith. And so, uh, so here's what they, what they were telling. Hey, let's just tell them no idolatry, you know, no fornication, and these kinds of things. So they still had some expectations upon them. So let me take, take the next step. Okay, so first of all, we say, well, God's called us to be holy. Some people say, well, yeah, well, how holy? You know, where are the divisions? Where are the lines? What do, how do we know where we're supposed to be? Well, you study the God's word. You do the best you can. You try to find out what he expects of us. You say, hey, I'm going to not do these things. I'm going to do these things because the Bible says it to the best of my ability. Okay, but let me give you the next point. The next point is this. Not only do we not want to be influenced and uh, imitate the practices of the pagans because simply because God says so, but secondly, because pagans should expect us to be different. Pagans should, I say. In fact, you know what? I started to put should, and then I scratched that out, because pagans do expect us to be different. You say, well, I don't know. There's a lot of you know, people out there in the world that you know, they expect Christians to be just like them and walk just like them. I don't believe that. I think... The pagans, and what I mean by that, just non-believers or people that worship other gods or whatever, when they look at Christianity, whether they would say it or not, or whether they show it or not, I believe they expect Christians to be different, distinctly different. All right. Now, let's just look at this from a logical standpoint. Why would you be trying to convert some? I know we're trying to preach the gospel. That's our main objective, right? P gospel has nothing to do with them changing their life or, 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 or acting differently or anything like that. I realize that. We're trying to preach the gospel so that they get saved. But are we not also preaching, hey, you know, this is wrong. Don't do this. 
you should be doing this, you know, uh, 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 turn from the wickedness. I'm not saying for salvation, but we are preaching that. Turn from the wickedness. Hey, this nation is going to be judged by God if they continue to live in wickedness. And Christians are expected from the world to be these voices saying, hey, this is what God expects of us. Don't do that. And they're supposed to be different. Now, look, in our society today, they don't want to accept that. And they want to believe this tolerance. All religions are the same. And, and hey, you can be a Christian, but you shouldn't you know, be any different from anybody else. You should already, uh, you should just respect everybody else's beliefs and all that kind of stuff. Look, that, that doesn't make sense because everybody knows that a Christian's job is to try to evangelize the world. <laughs> and why would we be trying to change somebody if we're no different than they are? Does that make any sense to you? If we're no different than they are, what do we have to offer them when there's no difference with us? And so if you think about it, the, Christ, the, the pagans expect Christians to be different. It's kind of like this. I hate using this analogy right now. Now, if I'm in good shape, I can use this analogy. I hate using this analogy right now. If I walk into a gym and I want a personal trainer that's going to help me get into shape, and some big, fat, sloppy guy walks out there, soft, no muscle tone, <laughs> you, know, you know, eating a donut, and he starts giving me dieting advice, I'm going to be like, wait a minute. <laughs> You know what I mean? And I've been to gyms, by the way, that <laughs> that do that. Okay? That doesn't make sense. That's not what you would expect. You'd expect you're going to go to the gym. Someone's going to teach you how to get in shape. They're probably going to be in shape. <laughs> right? And this is kind of uh, what the pagans expect Christians are trying to do. Maybe they don't agree with it or want the things that the Christians teach, but they expect that they're going to be trying to teach something different uh, than, than that. And this is why... I'll say a little bit more about that in a second, but this is why we should not choose to build our churches based on surveys of what the big churches do. You know, what's popular today? What's really bringing them in? You know, I looked back recently because I remember reading this a long time ago on the book. Uh, Rick Warren was one of the big ones to start this movement of asking the world, you know, how we should have church. And so there's this one page where they said, like, this is the ideal uh, target for our church. I don't remember what they call them, but this is like the ideal customer, if you will, you know, and they showed what he looked like and businessman in his, in, in his mid thirties. And, and he's got the cell phone and all that stuff. I think it was a beeper because his, that's the book's a little old, <laughs> but, uh, uh, and so they had this certain target and they were going after that. And so they had these surveys and they'd go around like, what kind of music would you like to hear in church? What kind of way would you like people to dress in church? What kind of preaching would you like to have in church? And they went into the world and did this. More currently, because now, now since this big, uh, maybe it was going on, it probably was for many you know, decades before that. But this really began to be popular at the end of the 80s and into the 90s. And uh, this big movement of this, con this contemporary movement, modernism, and, the, and maybe just in the Baptist world, it really began to take off. But they actually started doing this thing. I found out here in the last maybe 10 years, 20 years. I'm getting old, so I can, it's hard for me to remember. <laughs> I guess maybe, t maybe 15, 20 years ago, I heard about, have you ever heard of Secret Shoppers? Okay, let's say you have a business and you 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 have like fast a fast food business or something like that, and you want to know like how are your employees doing? What do people think about your service or whatever? They'll pay somebody to drive through, get some food, and they'll tell you you know to fill out this survey. By the way, uh, the survey is a big thing everywhere. I mean, uh, I was just talking to Jeff who works at McDonald's and they've got a survey. If you answer this survey, we'll give you some free food or whatever. And they want your feedback so you can tell them what they can do differently. And that was that's the concept in the business world. Hey, if we want to know what the customers want of us. And so if we got to fill out this survey. We got to get them to say, so they have the secret shopper. You know, this, they'll go in, they'll act like just a regular customer, but really they're there to observe and to write down some notes and fill out some things. Churches started doing secret shoppers. Churches started paying people to come to church. I remember hearing independent fundamental Baptists saying, I think this is kind of a good idea. Because then they come and they have to listen to the gospel, and then you get feedback from them and all that kind of stuff. But they're paying people to come to church and tell them, well, I think if you want to have any success, you ought to do this and you ought to, you ought to do that. Look, that doesn't even make sense. That doesn't even make sense that we go to the world who we're supposed to be teaching and helping them to understand and show them what the Bible says. And we say, how would you like to do church? And then we do it their way. You know what that means? They're converting us. <laughs> so it doesn't even make sense. But here's the funny thing. If you really think about it, 
the world might act like, hey, this Christian's cool. He doesn't have a problem with what I do or whatever. Hey, this I, I've heard people say, hey, I know Christians who believe in, uh, uh, you know, evolution. Or I know Christians that do this and, and, and they accept homosexuality. And I know Christians that do all this. And they're looking for those exceptions and they're th saying, hey, these guys are cool. Right. But really, they know in their mind that the reason they're cool is because they're not doing what they should be doing. <laughs> Because what they really expect is that a real Christian doesn't do those things. I'm glad this guy isn't a real Christian. You see what I'm saying? And so, look, you knock on the door. Oftentimes, you say, oh, you're a Baptist? Or, oh, you're a Christian? Whatever. And they'll say, well, you probably don't want me because I'm this or that. You know? And you say, well, where did you even get that idea from? You know, what makes you say that? You know? You could say, well, because there's so many Christians that, you know, have knocked on my door and they didn't want anything to do with me. I, how many of you think that's probably what happened? <laughs> that many Christians aren't out there knocking on doors. You know, how many people think that the average church out there, if a, some, if a member of the LGBT community walked into their church, they would be kicked out of their church? How many, th I mean, percentage wise, how many churches do you think exist like that? One, one out of a hundred, maybe, maybe even less than that. I don't know. Uh, but that's the narrative that you hear all the time. Like, oh, Christians just hate, uh, you know. Why do they believe that? Because they know that Christians are supposed to be different. Amen. They're supposed to be set apart. They're supposed to be teaching something different. And they know it's probably something that naturally they're not going to like, right? And so it really makes sense if you think about it. Pagans expect us to be, different, to be distinctly different from them. <clears throat> Let me go to just to, to the third point. I'll skip a little bit here for the sake of time. This is a slightly different point here, but okay. So we ought to be set apart, different, uh, you know, from the world. Don't be pagan. Don't ask, you know, how pagan can we get? And so just try to be distinctly different from the world. We need to do that, number one, because just simply God said so. Be ye holy, for I am holy. He said, come out from among them, be ye separate. He said so many places in the Bible, you know, friendship with the world is enmity with God. I mean, you know, it doesn't mean don't reach them. Obviously, we want to reach them. And in order to reach them, obviously, we've got to understand some things about their culture and maybe be able to speak the same language that they do. But we, we've got to be distinctly different from them. And, uh, and then not only that, common sense says the pagans expect us to be different from them. And again, pagan, I'm just talking about non-believers or people that believe other, other religions. Uh, and so the third thing is this, a little bit of a different point, but I probably broke all the rules of speech that I, taught, I was taught in school. 2 Corinthians 6 again. When you separate from pagan practices, believe it or not, you're going to be enlarging your ministry. In other words, it's going to be a good thing for you in the ministry, even though all the common teaching out there and everything you would think would say that actually you need to be more like them or, or whatever to be able to be popular or to be able to be effective, I believe the truth is that you will actually be enlarging your ministry the more separate from pagan practices. And I'll, I'll say this, uh, I do remember when I was uh, working... Uh, a couple different places, but one place in particular when I was going to Bible college and I was working at this place, they made a, a I gotta stop talking here for a second so I can find my place. Okay. Let's see. Espanol. No, that's not. Okay. Uh, uh, when I worked at this place, it was, it was, it, they, we made circuit boards. It was one of those real dumb jobs. I mean, not dumb, but like anybody could do a job. You push a button and you wait for the machine to. <clears throat> and uh, anyway, I got to talking to a lot of people and they all knew I was a Christian. They all knew I went to Bible college. Uh, there was a time where I had to separate from them and not hang out with them in the break room. They had already heard my positions. I already had uh, tried to witness to them. I tried to be friendly with them. Sometimes I find myself even getting into the conversations. Everybody probably knows what that's like that I shouldn't have been in. And then I realize later, like, man, I shouldn't have done that. They need to, they need to know that I'm, I'm not going to entertain those kind of conversations and stuff like that. <clears throat> and so there's a time where I separated from them. When we eat lunch, I would always sit with them. 
but then the conversation would go a way that it shouldn't go, or they would just be doing it, and I just felt like it was a bad deal. So, you know, I told, I told some of them that asked, well, how come you're not coming to the break room with us anymore? And I'd say, you know what? I really need to get caught up in my Bible study, so I'm going to the other room, and I'm, and I'm just reading my Bible or whatever. And, you know, after a while, I started isolating from some of these people. They started separating from me. You know, I wasn't coming out from among them and being separate necessarily. I uh, didn't even have to do that. It just naturally, we're, I was separated from them, okay? And I thought, man... Am I, if this, is this bad? Am I really not having a ministry now? Because here I am in Bible college. I'm trying to learn how to preach the gospel to people. And here I am separating myself. Maybe I should be in that break room. What's the world say? Jesus would have been hanging right out with them. He would be in the bars and he would be in there. And this is what the world says. Like this is, this is the Jesus that they know, you know. But here's what I found out started to happen. This lady would come up to me and say, can I ask you something? I remember this particular particular conversation. I don't know if I've ever shared any, this with anybody, but she was like, I'm really concerned. She said, my son is a homosexual. What's the Bible teach about homosexuality? I'm thinking, why would she come ask me? Well, why do you think she came ask me? <laughs> she knows that I would have a problem with that. She knows the Bible teaches something against that. And so she wants to know what I think about that. Privately, she doesn't want me in her group. You know what I mean? Talking about that in front of everybody. But she knows that if I have a question, that guy over there reads his Bible. That guy over there is separated. That guy over there is a Christian. I can go to him and he'll be honest with me and tell me what the Bible says. Kind of like Micaiah, right? <laughs> All the other prophets telling him what, he, what they want to hear, but they just know that that's not right. And so they seek out Micaiah and he tells them exactly what they didn't want to hear. <laughs> but they knew that that was the truth all along. And so that they came, uh, so they would come to me. And another time, somebody would come to me, and I'd have people just come up to me, you know, like, "Hey, what must I do to be saved?" <laughs> I mean, that kind of a, those kinds of stories. And uh, and look, a lot of them didn't just start changing and start coming to church and all that kind of stuff. But I was able to present the gospel to a lot of people, answer a lot of questions about what the Bible says, and I actually found that my ministry at that work, at my work, actually grew. And it's so funny how people are like, "Man." Don't offend them. Don't say that. I don't, you know, uh, I've been, I've heard people say something like, I've been working on my friend for 10 years trying to get to a point where I can show them the gospel. And uh, here you are, and you're saying all this stuff, and you're just going to drive them away. And I'm thinking, it's taking you 10 years, and you haven't preached the gospel? Maybe your plan's not working, buddy. <laughs> Why don't you let me try it my way? And so, uh, uh, so this is kind of the common thinking of, uh, of Christians today. A lot of Christians think, no, 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 you got to be like them to, to reach them. you got to be just like them and all this kind of stuff. Didn't work. Now, now Paul the Apostle is a great soul winner, great evangelist, probably greatest of all times outside of Jesus. And, uh, you know, uh, he has this saying about becoming all things to all people. And, uh, well, that's kind of our the way that we just summarize what he said. But when you even watch his life, there was a time when he said, you know what? I'm going to take Timothy and I'm going to get him circumcised and I'm going to go into the temple and I'm going to do all this and that. And he said he wanted to do that so he didn't offend the Jews. And you know what happened? He ended up getting beat anyway, <laughs> right? And so even when that heart is right and that motivation is right, and you're like, I just want to reach him. I'll do anything to reach him. I'll have Easter egg hunts. I'll do this. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll do whatever it takes. We'll have a party. We'll have a, we'll have a, a, a rocking out for Jesus. <laughs> You know what I mean? Uh, there's a, our, some churches in our community in Iola get together and they say, hey, we'll put aside our differences or whatever. We'll just preach Jesus and we'll get together. And they had the opportunity somehow to get together in the public school. And they have like this, uh, this rock fest, I guess, whatever it is. It's, it's supposed to be Christian, but they go in there and all the people that take their instruments and the drums and the guitars and all that stuff. And it's apparently, I don't know if they still do it, but they used to do it. And it was a big day where lots of people came. And you're like, yeah, that's how we're going to reach them. Not really. Not really. You might draw a crowd. You might be, see some people that start calling themselves Christians because they like being the cool Christian or whatever. But if you really want to have a, an effective ministry... It's going to happen the more you se separate yourself from pagan practices. And that's where Paul was the most effective. When he's preaching, even in the midst of being stoned for what he believes and, uh, and being cursed and all these kinds of things, a big group of people said, you know what, we'll hear this guy again. You know, <laughs> There's something about this man's faith that I need to know about. Why is he so different? Look at uh, verse 11 of our text here. 
Still wasn't there. He says, O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you. Our heart is enlarged. Ye are not straightened in us. Now, that straightened doesn't mean like if it had a GH in it, it would be straight, like, you know, not crooked. But straightened here, uh, S-T-R-A-I-T has to do with being narrow. Okay, straight is the way, uh, narrow, uh, or narrow is the way, straight is the gate, you know, that kind of an idea. And if you think about it, it makes sense because he's just talking about being enlarged. And then now he's talking about straightened. Okay, that's the opposite of enlarged. And so he says, ye are not straightened in us, but ye are straightened in your own bowels. Now for a recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children, be ye also enlarged. Okay, now he tells them how to be enlarged. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And he goes on, we've already read the rest of it, uh, the rest of this part. You know, don't, don't be like the unbeliever. Don't be like the infidel. You know, you need to... You need to have a more effective ministry than that. And so he actually tells him to come out from among them. Be said, but look at 1 Chronicles 4, and this is it. This is, and then I'm done. 1 Chronicles 4.10 is what we know as the prayer of Jabez. Now, ironically, guys like Rick Warren, uh, Purpose Driven Church, and all that, uh, you know, they really promoted the prayer of Jabez. Uh, mainstream Christianity promoted it. It was a book. <clears throat> I never read it, so I can't tell you. I think it was a book. It was actually an old book, but they were kind of like, it, 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 it kind of came back, had a comeback. And everybody was sharing that, and they were praying this prayer of Jabez. And really what it came down to is kind of like a prosperity gospel, you know, hey, you just pray this prayer, and God's going to bless you kind of an idea. But here's what the prayer is, First Chronicles 4.10. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed, and enlarge my coast, and that thine hand might be with me, and that thou wouldest keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. And God granted him that which he requested. Now you can see how the world could take that and be like, Oh man, that's what we need to do. We just need to all pray, God bless me. God enlarge my coast, you know. In the business world, that would be like, hey, give me a bigger business. Multiply my wealth and all this kind of stuff. That's what we need to do. We need to pray. But look, over and over from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, God's teaching this, that, hey, you want God to bless you, you're going to have to do it his way. And you're going to have to come out from among them and be separate. And you're going to have to follow God with all your heart. And you're going to do those things. And then guess what? He's going to bless you. But that doesn't probably look like what the world thinks of when they say bless. <laughs> Right? What the world means when they say bless is I want lots of money, I want fame, I want popularity, I want all that kind of stuff. But success, like Psalm 1 success, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the success that we see in the Bible doesn't have anything to do with all the wealth and all that stuff. It has to do with being fruitful for the Lord. It has to do with laying tr up treasures in heaven. And uh, in accomplishing the work that he's called us to do on this earth. And really our prayer should be, God, enlarge my coast. Meaning, give me a more effective ministry. Amen. Help me reach more people. Help me be able to have a greater impact on the community with the gospel of Christ. And with even helping believers to grow in the Lord. And teaching them and instructing them how to do that stuff. But I'm telling you right now, it's not going to be enlarged if you continue to be just like the world. The only way your ministry is going to be enlarged is if you come out from among them and be separate. So don't ask the question, how pagan can we get, <laughs> right? should be more like, how distinctly different can we be from the pagans, <laughs> right? According to the Bible, don't just make up your own, uh, your own traditions and stuff like that. But according to the Bible, how can we be as distinctly different as we can? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. I pray you help us as your church to be holy, set apart, and be different from the world. But help us not to do that in an arrogant way or, or a uh, hypocritical way or holier-than-thou way that would, that would hinder us from being able to share that gospel. But help us do it with the right heart, right motivation. Uh, and I pray that as a result of that, you would give us a more effective ministry and enlarge our coast. I pray you be glorified. And in Jesus' name, amen.